this video provides an introduction to RNA-seq data analysis and also to an RNA-seq data analysis course where we learn how to find differential expressed genes. But first I want to motivate you, why should you understand data analysis? Well, bioinformaticians might not always be available when you need them. On the other hand, you as the researcher probably know your own uh, experiment best. So for example, if you discover batch effects in your data, you might be able to figure out where they came from. You also know your research question well. So for example, the genes and pathways involved. Understanding data analysis also allows you to design experiments better, so you will understand why you need uh, replicates, preferably many of them, and what number of reads uh, you would need, so that you don't run too small experiments which are effectively just uh, wasting money. Even if you are not planning to do data analysis yourself, understanding data analysis enables you to discuss better with bioinformaticians. So in this course, uh, first I will give a short introduction to RNA sequencing. In the practical exercises, uh, you will learn how to operate the Chipster software, which is pretty easy to use. But the main point really is to learn uh, RNA-seq data analysis, so the central concepts, what analysis steps you need to do, and what kind of file formats uh, are involved. And as we go, we also point out things that you should take into account when designing experiments. So let's have a look at the short introduction to RNA sequencing. So when we talk about RNA sequencing, we usually mean sequencing poly-A RNA. So uh, we uh, sequence a certain number of reads. Uh, you can decide that yourself. And you aim to have a snapshot of the situation. So what, what transcripts are present in your cells? With this information, then, you can answer various questions. So if you have, for example, two different sample groups, normal samples and, say, cancer samples, you can look for differentially expressed genes. You can also see if, between those conditions, uh, there are differences between isoforms uh, which are expressed. On the other hand, you can discover uh, new transcripts or even new genes, and even new whole transcript tomes. You can also look for genomic variants and allele-specific expression. Here I'm talking about bulk RNA-seq, but of course you can also do single-cell RNA-seq, which then allows you to answer uh, different kind of questions, and we have tutorials on that as well. So let's have a brief look what happens in the lab. So typically we start with poly-A RNA because we don't want to sequence ribosomal RNA and there is a lot of that in the cells. Uh, then we fragment these transcripts or we convert them to double-stranded um, cDNA and fragment that. So the idea with fragmentation is that typically uh, transcripts are quite long and the Illumina sequencing uh, sequences uh, usually from say 100 to 200 base long reads. So one read is not going to cover one transcript. And as the sequencing happens from the ends uh, of, the, of the fragments, we need to have as many fragments as we can to cover the whole length of the transcript. So we fragment and the fragmentation happens at random locations. Then we amplify our fragments and uh, ligate sequencing adapters. So now we have what we call a library, and we can also do size selection. 
and then we sequence. And the sequencing can happen either from one end of the fragment, then we could talk about single end sequencing, or from both ends of the fragment, which is paired end sequencing. It's also possible to have so-called stranded data. So RNA-seq data can be either unstranded or stranded, and if it's stranded, it can be stranded in different ways. So there are several lab methods, and you need to know which one was used when your data was produced. If you don't know, it's not a problem. There are actually analysis tools that can figure that out for you. So basically, what does this strandedness mean? Well, if you have stranded data, uh, then you know that uh, uh, you can figure out from which strand uh, the parental gene is. And this can be useful in situations like this. So here we have a read uh, which maps to, to this uh, place in the genome. And it happens to be that in this location, there are actually two genes. So gene A on the forward strand and gene B on the reverse strand. Now, if our reads were produced with unstranded protocol, we wouldn't be able to tell if this read comes from a transcript of gene A or gene B. So which one is expressed? If we have stranded data, we can resolve this question. So, always when possible, it is a good idea to have stranded data. Let's then look at the analysis steps involved. So, to begin with, uh, when you have raw data, you essentially just have your sequencing reads. So, say about 100 base pair long uh, sequences. Now, we need to put identity on them. So where do they come from? And to do that, uh, we align these reads to the reference genome. Once we know their location in the reference genome, we can compare that information to the um, annotation information of that genome. So in other words, uh, we know where the genes are located. So for example, we know that gene B is here and gene A is here. So we match this information and then we can just count the number of reads per genes. So here we have for gene A, we have six reads and gene B, we have 11 reads. So essentially this is an estimate of the expression level of that gene. We do this for all the samples and then we combine the results to a table. So here I have my samples. I have six samples from two different groups. And then I have all the genes and the number of reads that map to each gene in each sample. In order to find differentially expressed genes, we compare the values uh, in this group to the values in the other group. And then we can say that, for example, gene A seems to be upregulated in this group. So this is, of course, a simplification, but this gives you the idea of what we are doing. Uh, in reality, it's a bit more complicated, so we actually have a bit more steps. And we are going to discuss all these steps during the course. For each of these steps, uh, there is an analysis tool, so don't worry if you don't know this, these names yet. You will by the end of the day. And then here you can see the file formats that are used in the different steps. So what we had here was differential expression analysis, which is just one thing that you can do with RNA-seq data. So uh, in this figure here, we have uh, different steps. So it, uh, don't worry about this chapter, this and that text. It's just because the figure comes from a book uh, that we have written about RNA-seq. But so basically, you start with checking the quality of your reads. If there is a problem, you might decide to uh, trim or filter the reads. Then you align them to genome, and then you do that counting per genes. 
as I just mentioned, and then you can do a differential expression analysis. Once you have aligned the raised genome, you can also assemble new transcripts using the genome as a guide and quantitate those as well. If you don't have reference genome, you can align your reads to the transcripts you have. And if you don't have transcript either, you can actually make one uh, based on the reads you have. Nowadays, you can also uh, bypass the, the genome alignment step. There, is a, there are new tools which can do the quantitation uh, without that. But, but during this course, uh, we are doing these steps indicated in red or purple here. So essentially, uh, this is the workflow that we are going to follow. We check the quality of the reads. We pre-process them if we notice that there is a problem. Then we map them to reference genome, check the quality again, count the reads per genes. Then we can do another type of quality control. And then we do differential expression analysis and we can visualize our reads and results in the genomic context. 